Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. As we planned our agenda for today, against the background of coronavirus and the peaceful protests in response to what's just the latest brutal examples of racial injustice, we knew what we had to do. Uh, while we generally like panels to be cross-cutting and incorporate issues like an environmental, environmental justice organically, we were convinced that only by bringing together a panel, this panel, Advancing Climate Solutions Through Environmental Justice, on this topic, could we properly address the gravity of it and fully explore how to improve our present situation. To help us do that, it is my privilege to introduce Senator Chris Van Hollen uh, from the great state of Maryland. Hi, I'm Chris Van Hollen, and I'm proud to represent the great state of Maryland in the United States Senate. I'm especially pleased to join all of you for this year's gathering of the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Caucus. Uh, I look forward to when we can do the exhibition in person again, uh, but uh, don't let anybody say that a pandemic got in the way of our efforts uh, to bring people together to address these important energy uh, issues. Uh, and to any Marylanders out there, I am proud of the fact that we are moving ahead, uh, seeking federal approval for two offshore wind projects, uh, making Maryland a state at the cutting edge of uh, renewable energy. And we also have to think of the jobs that will bring to Maryland and the jobs that energy efficiency and renewable energy will bring uh, to other parts of the country and parts of the world. We also need to focus very hard on the issue of environmental justice because how we interact with the environment uh, has to do with how we organize our societies. And whether it's the issue of lead in the water in Flint, Michigan, or lead in paint in apartment buildings in Baltimore City uh, that poisoned people like Freddie Gray, or whether it's the pollution uh, from toxins from coal-fired power plants that disproportionately impact communities of color and low-income communities, uh, or whether it's the impact of storms like Hurricane Katrina that devastated the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. And we saw the color line uh, there after uh, the Katrina hit so badly. Uh, so we've got to really focus on these issues. This is a moment of reckoning in our country in so many ways. And with the passing of our dear friend and mentor, John Lewis, uh, let's look at 2020, uh, the way he approached 1965, uh, which is getting in the way of injustice as he marched across the bridge in Selma, Alabama. Uh, we've got to get in the way of environmental injustice, and we have a terrific panel here uh, to do that with us. Uh, and we're having representatives from the American Association of Blacks in Energy, representatives from the Solar Energy Industries Association, a representative from the Energy Storage Association, and a representative from the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, and somebody from NCE Clean Energy. So there's an awful lot to talk about uh, as we address uh, the issues of climate change and energy and the issue of justice. So. Without further ado, let me turn it over uh, to our great panel. Take care and thank you. Thanks uh, very much to Senator Van Hollen and his uh, fantastic staff for all of their work to help make today possible. Um, and special thanks for me personally as a constituent who lives in gorgeous Prince George's in Maryland, just east of DC. Over the course of the rest of the day, we will feature welcome messages from the other members of Congress who lead the House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses. Uh, we would not be here today without their support, uh, and we really appreciate it. EESI was founded in 1984 to provide nonpartisan information on environmental, energy, and climate issues to policymakers on Capitol Hill and to the public. We do this in different ways, including by holding briefings, which are all archived online, and writing fact sheets and articles, 
and other things too. I encourage everyone to visit us online at www.eesi.org and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. There's really no better way to keep up with all that we're up to. As many of you have, current, uh, current events have caused EESI to look inward and think about how we can do a better job telling the stories of frontline communities and explaining how environmental justice can and must be a part of future climate change policy. And to help us do that, we want to learn from the experiences and successes of others. And that brings us to our panelists, who as professionals are leading the way, and as representatives of organizations that are not just committed to making a positive difference, difference they are actually making a positive difference. This is our longest panel of the day, which will let us hear more voices, and it will give us more time for questions. We are taking questions, which can be submitted via Twitter, at EESI Online. You can also send an email to us, EESI at EESI.org. And now on to the panel. Our five panelists are Polly Glover, President and CEO of the American Association of Blacks and Energy, Abby Ross Hopper, President and CEO of the Solar Energy Industries Association, Kelly Speaks Backman, CEO of the Energy Storage Association, John Bowman, Managing Director for Government Affairs at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and Stephanie Chen, Senior Policy Counsel for MCE. For full biographies of our panelists, visit www.esi.org. Paula, your first panelist, uh, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to your remarks. Uh, and so over to you, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me and including me in this really great discussion. Um, you know, for me, and I'm, I suspect for many of us, this summer has really been a time of uncertainty, um, a little bit of anxiety, some turmoil, um, and hopefully a lot of reflection. Um, we've been locked down because of COVID-19 for now four or five months. Um, my work-life balance, as I suspect with many of you, has been completely upended. Um, and we're having a collective aha moment as it relates to racial justice and the inequities that exist in our country for African-American and our communities. We know that African-American communities are lagging behind in access to education, employment, wealth attainment, health disparities. We're harder hit by unemployment. There's a disparity in home ownership, housing, and in our energy costs and energy burden. The truth of the matter is, however, that these inequities have been around for generations. In fact, in our own industry, there's a lack of representation of African-Americans in leadership and participation of African-American-owned businesses um, across sector. But today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about climate and environmental justice. And so I'm gonna start with energy efficiency, which is also one of the most effective means to address the issues of climate change but it's the least costly climate mitigation asset. In fact, according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ACEEE, in the US, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2020, 2050, through energy efficiency alone. However, to achieve this result, energy efficiency must be available across all income levels and not only for those who can afford it. At the same time, there's a direct connection between energy burden and energy efficiency. And unless we fully resolve the issue of energy efficiency access, the inequities and in energy burden will persist. According to the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, low-income households experience larger energy costs than all other economic demographics. That's probably not a surprise. But this increased energy burden is particularly high for African-American families, equaling a median energy burden that is 64% higher than white households. Data from Energy Efficiency for All and the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy revealed that for African-American households, 42% of the excess energy burden is due to inefficient housing, with this number increasing substantially when segmenting for renters, where the percentage equals 97%. And a significant portion of this burden can be abated simply by utilizing robust energy efficiency policies, including home retrofits, use of energy efficient appliances, targeting pro targeted programming to ensure that low-income families have access and that includes affordability and ensuring that these same households are successfully able to adopt and retain these measures. If low-income housing stock is brought to the same energy efficient levels as the medium, 
we would eliminate 35% of the, the household energy burden. However, it's not enough that clean energy and climate to lower um, that, however, it's not enough that clean energy and climate lower the energy burden and improve the health for low-income families. This new energy economy has the potential to create significant economic gains and um, legislation that directly connects African-Americans and other underrepresented groups to jobs, leadership, and contracts must take a priority. In 2019, energy efficiency was reported as the fastest growing sector in the industry, producing the highest number of jobs. However, communities of color are significantly underrepresented, with African Americans equaling only 8% of the energy efficiency workforce as compared to whites who equal 77%. And what we know is that while I'm only talking about energy efficiency, these numbers are reflective in all parts of our energy sectors. And while these sector gains have been lost as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, we have an opportunity as we move forward to ensure that we not only get policy right, but that we prioritize access. And so it's important that our good policy um, has to have everybody involved. If we want to address climate change, we have to look at it through a lens of environmental justice. But what I mean is not that your solution addressing environmental impacts is automatically a good solution. That's likely to be true as it is likely to be untrue. Remember, I started by saying that when it comes to African-American communities, the inequities that exist are multifaceted and they're layered. And that requires that solutions must take into account all of these inequities. That means that the cost of the solution matters it means the opportunities that a solution creates matters and how we're going to ensure and maybe even mandate at times that these same communities are getting access and support so that they can fully participate. That matters. The gaps are wide and to shrink them requires a level of intentionality and focus that in some ways is foreign to how we solve problems. It means that we must have everyone at the table particularly those who we may disagree with to get to the right outcomes. It means that while the problem is difficult, getting to the right solution is also difficult. There likely is no simple answer, but if we are up to the work, we can get there. And if we do the work right, we'll lessen the gap. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, that was great. Um, really appreciated you kicking us off uh, with this panel today. Um, Abby, um, welcome to the Expo, and um, thanks for joining us. I'm looking forward to your remarks. Dan, thank you so much um, for having me, and um, thank you so much for prioritizing this issue and making it the, the marquee panel of your day. I appreciated your comments at the beginning. Um, for those that don't know us, there's three of us on this panel that have worked together for more than a decade. Um, Kelly and Dan and I are all alumni of the great state of Maryland um, and the Maryland Energy Administration. So it's it's really an honor to be here with you and to watch you continue to do this great work, Dan. So thank you very much. Um, and Paula, I, anytime I get to follow Paula Glover is an honor. So thank you for those words. Um, so if we haven't met before, my name is Abby Hopper. I am the president and CEO of the Solar Energy Industries Association. I'm actually in my office today for the, it's only the third time or the fourth time since March 12th, um, but I have really bad Wi-Fi at home, I've learned. And so if I wanna actually be heard and seen and not have those weird glitches, I gotta come in here. So I get to, you get to see my caps gear and my calendar that seems so important in January and it's completely irrelevant today. Um, but Paula, I really, it was hard to listen to that sort of, um, that list of, of uh, challenges that uh, African-American families face. Um, I acknowledge, I really acknowledge the reality of it, um, but it's hard to, to really face some of these truths. And so I just want to talk a little bit about the solar industry and how we bring these issues of social justice and racial justice into our work. So they're integrated into our work and they're not over on the sidelines as a sort of to-do 
later on if we get around to it. Um, so one of the things that's been so critical for me personally and for us as a, an association, as an industry, is to really acknowledge the interrelated nature of these issues. So we think about the climate crisis and we think about the economic and health crisis and we think about the racial justice crisis. Um, they're not brand new, as Paula said, these, especially the racial justice crisis has been uh, long standing and systematically um, put in place. Uh, but those three crises, I think, are incredibly linked. We know that communities of color are most dramatically impacted by where fossil fuel generators are placed. They um, are experiencing the brunt of this health crisis and the brunt of this economic crisis. And so as I think about how do we create policy that helps address a number of these issues at the same time? Um, clean energy is energy efficiency, certainly, but clean energy as well is a critical part of that. I want to start with just some facts um, about the solar industry and not about how many megawatts we have or how many um, tons of carbon we displace. I could do that, but instead I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the reality of our industry and I'm going to talk about our workforce. And we have done, you know, you can't solve a problem if you don't know what the problem is. Um, so we have taken a deep look, a deep dive into our own industry to see who works here and where do they work. And so I'm just going to look down so I don't get the stats wrong. Um, but in the solar industry, we, we do this annual diversity study. And our diversity study from last year showed um, that in the solar workforce, about 8% of our workforce is made up of um, black workers, about 9% of Asian workers. 73% um, of us are white. Um, we only have about 26% women in the solar industry. Um, and so you clearly clear gaps in terms of um, our, our workforce being representative of our society. Um, but that wasn't enough. Like I didn't, I, I cared deeply about sort of who was here, but I also wanted to know where they sat in the solar industry. Are they CEOs like Kelly and Paula and I, or are they admins um, at the front desk answering the phone? Those are both worthy jobs, but they're very different um, opportunities. And so we took a look at, at sort of job titles and at sort of senior executives, and it was um, incredibly troubling what we found. We found that in the solar industry, 88% of the senior executives in the solar industry are white. Um, only 2% of the senior executives in the solar industry um, are black. And so as we think about not just our workforce, but wealth creation opportunities, um, uh, sort of entrepreneurship opportunities, those statistics tell us that we have such a long way to go. And so, you know, do I wish I came here with better numbers? Of course, but I'm not going to shy away from the reality of where we are. What I want to talk about, though, is what do we do about it, right? <laughs> uh, what do we do about it? And, and I want to talk about both our workforce and then I'm going to talk about our customer base because those are two really important constituencies. And as I think about our workforce and uh, sort of how we build policy um, that in sense a, uh, a more inclusive workforce. Um, there's all kinds of great uh, conversation out there. I, I follow Paula's lead. Paula has done some great thinking about organizations and sort of how we, what do we need to do? Um, one of the things I think about a lot is about supplier diversity. And we're really challenging ourselves and our industry around how do we uh, make sure that our companies are spending on, you know, intentionally spending with uh, businesses that are owned um, by by African American companies, by women owned companies, those sorts of things. So there's a great deal of work happening now as a result of these conversations. Um, but we also think about sort of policy that's been introduced in Congress. Um, we have been very supportive uh, of Representative um, uh, Russia's legislation, the blue collar to green collar jobs act that would support renewable energy workers in their transition into this economy. Those sorts of very intentional policy pieces uh, really make a difference. Um, we also think about the our customers though, right? Like who has the benefits? Paula was talking about sort of families having access to energy efficiency. I think about who has access to solar energy and how do we ensure that families um, of all varieties have access to that, to that um, what is actually an incredibly low cost um, and really reliable source of energy. And so as I think about how we weave policy into ensuring that, that outcome, um, there are a couple of ways to do it, right? We think about um, community solar. 
Community Solar is a really um, great tool to make sure that homeowners, or homeowners, as well as non-homeowners, right? So maybe it's people that live in multifamily housing, maybe that people are renters, maybe that people that don't have the credit or the capital to invest in solar systems on their own homes still have access um, to that resource. And so we have a very uh, vigorous policy efforts in states as well as in Congress around ensuring that community solar is a as an option and that there's a regulatory pathway to make sure that it happens. But there's also other legislation um, in Congress, Senator Duckworth and uh, Representative McEachin's Low Income Solar Energy Act that will help use LAHEAP money to help um, uh, invest in solar. And it makes sense because as I said, solar is many places the lowest, uh, the lowest cost energy source. And so lowering the energy burden for families uh, makes a ton of sense. These are just a couple of the things um, that we are working on to help address some of these issues kind of in an institution, not an institution, that's a big word for my organization, but in a, um, in a uh, organizational front, we have elevated our work around diversity, equity, um, and justice to a board level effort. And so again, following Paula's lead about how do we, how do we start addressing some of these issues? Um, our, my board is taking some pretty aggressive steps to hold ourselves accountable to do the work that we need to do um, to make sure that justice is threaded throughout our work, as I said, and not simply an afterthought. So, Dan, again, thank you so much um, for having me here. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, and yes, I, I didn't give it away, but you and Kelly and I are um, part of a uh, the M MEA Alumni Association, and they're doing, they're continuing to do great work. Somehow they've managed to, to, to move on without us. Um, it's a great, it's amazing when I look around DC, the folks who work there uh, and all the great work they do, whether it's at SEA or Energy Storage or NRDC or multiple SEA people actually. So thank you so much. Kelly, um, we're going to turn to you. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I think you have maybe the most professional looking background. Um, so at least um, you'll, you'll send, you're the middle panelist, you're going to center us. Always in the center, Dan. Um, thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm so proud to be on this panel with such an amazing set of speakers. Um, and um, one of the, it's funny, preparing my remarks today, I was thinking about metrics and thinking about, you know, something that someone from Maryland said to all of us, I'm heard, sure we've heard it a thousand times, like whatever it does, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. And so that's a little bit about what I talk about in the context of, of social equity. Um, you know, for, I'll start with ESA. ESA is the National Trade Association for Storage, working toward a more resilient, efficient, sustainable, and affordable grid. We represent a diverse group of more than 190 companies across the entire value chain of storage. So we've got manufacturers, we've got implementers, we've got grid operators, we've got all those services around it. Our members work with all types of energy storage technologies and chemistries, including batteries, mechanical, thermal, pump hydro. And together over the last five years, this very diverse set of, of companies and interests changed policies and regulatory constructs in states at the federal and uh, and also in organized markets. 32 states have added storage planning requirements. Nine states now have targets. Six states have incentive programs. Our industry in the last five years or so has installed about 1,500 megawatts of new storage from like nearly nothing, uh, with a third of that behind the meter and another eight plus gigawatts contracted for non pumped hydro storage in the next five years. And I tell you this a little bit to brag about how we're doing, because that's pretty awesome in terms of storage enabling the rest of the a clean grid. But also I want to convey how important it is to have a really diverse set of interests and perspectives if you want to change the world, right? So for ESA, we're here working with many of these people on this panel because we want to change the way we generate, deliver, and use energy. We want to change how things have been done since the first power plant was built in 1882. But clearly we haven't gone far enough to address social equity and personal diversity, inclusion, and equity in the workplace. Um, social justice is just frankly the, the right thing to do. And I think it's absolutely necessary to be conscious and active
disruptive about creating a diverse, inclusive, and equitable workplace if we want to see a different world, one in which we're proud of, and specific to the energy industry, one which is sustainable and healthy. So if we want a different grid, we need to reimagine how we're doing it now. We need to think and look at, look at it differently. If we want to reimagine it, we, have to, we need new perspectives. And if we need and want new perspectives, we have to have new minds in the room with different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities, different ages, and with different disciplines in training and professional work and backgrounds. We need to do it all differently and we need to do it with a different set of people, people that don't come from the same backgrounds as, as us, and we have to do it collaboratively. So it, it doesn't mean doing away with best practices or engineering principles or considerations of long and short-term costs and all of those things that we in the energy industry pay attention to. It means instead integrating these diverse experiences, resetting our priorities and objectives, and then finding a way to balance this broad set of insights to move forward in a sustainable and equitable manner. Um, last year at our annual conference, I had uh, to Dr. Tony Byers. He's a former global director of diversity and inclusion at Starbucks and um, author of the book, The Multiplier Effect of Inclusion, How Diversity and Inclusion Advances Innovation and Drives Growth. He talks about in, in speeches, I just highly recommend if you can Google him, just hear about what he has to say. He talks about and quantifies how diversity and inclusion of your workforce can bring about more profitability for companies, more benefits to communities they serve, and longer term stability for all of us. And it's just a really powerful lesson that I'd like to uh, leave us with that thought of this is the right thing to do, it's important that we do it, and it'll get us along the way of what we're looking for in clean energy future. So thanks, Dan, really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun to be here with y'all. Thanks, Kelly. That was really great. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you being here too. Um, our next panelist is uh, John Oman with NRDC. John, welcome to the expo. Welcome to this panel. Um, really looking forward to your remarks. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks everybody else on the panel. Uh, I am from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, we're a group of about 700 folks, uh, international. Uh, we have offices in New York, Washington, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, uh, China, and India. Um, I sit in our DC office. Um, talking about and thinking about uh, environmental justice, uh, we at NRDC look at it uh, from a number of different angles. Uh, we work with our EJ partners to help pass laws and ordinances at the state, local, and federal level. Uh, we also work with our EJ partners uh, and litigate on their behalf. Uh, so uh, when we look at how we can make climate advantages, I think one of the things that we've learned uh, in going through this pandemic is that folks who have been um, suffering with uh, dirty air uh, have been especially hit hard uh, by uh, this virus. Uh, so we, we look at trying to figure out ways to go back and mitigate some of those communities. Um, um, uh, so what can we do on the federal level? Uh, what can we do on the state level? Uh, and along with a number of other environmental groups and our EJ partners, uh, we started to look at like, what, what, what do we need to do? What are some of the, who are some of the better thinkers? Uh, one of the bills that we are really promoting um, is Cory Booker's uh, environmental, uh, I'm sorry, um, the National Environmental Justice Act for, for 2019. Uh, that bill would do a lot of things and go a lot a long way toward uh, making things uh, equal for disadvantaged communities. It would codify and expand President Clinton's uh, 1994 Executive Order on Environmental Justice. Um, it would require federal agencies to consider uh, EJ uh, cumulative impacts when they're doing permitting uh, for Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act projects. Um, the bill would also allow communities like Flint to bring statutory and common law claims um, and would it reinstate a, 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 a right, a, a, um, I'm totally lost my place, um, a right of action, a, a right of action under common law. Um, so it's a huge bill. We think that's, that, would, that would be very important. And also 
the Environmental Justice Act by Chairman Grijalva and Representative McEachin, uh, which they included a ton of environmental voices from around the country in helping them craft uh, that bill. Um, uh, we, we also look at ways that, um, that we can get some climate gains in the environmental justice community. Um, proposing the creation of, envi of an environmental justice fund that would have a $50 billion annual budget uh, that would address pollution and health threats in disadvantaged communities. Um, require mandatory uh, pollution reduction in EJ communities. Um, to that end, NRDC, along with two other, 282 other national environmental and environmental justice groups, signed the Equitable and Just Climate Platform, uh, which is built on three major precepts. Uh, that everybody has a right to breathe cl clean air, live free from dangerous levels of toxins, and share access to healthy food. Um, we've, we are proposing meaningful investments uh, uh, in disadvantaged communities to promote EV ownership and uh, EV infrastructure, um, electrify transit sources, um, and have federal agencies to, to create budgets that would allow for uh, resilience investments uh, for disadvantaged communities. Um, and I think to close, uh, education. Um, I am, I consider myself a fairly educated person. Um, and like a lot of folks who probably want to move into um, an electric vehicle, let's just say, um, until Abby and I sat on a panel last summer at the CBC, I was really pretty ignorant. I mean, I see the, the, the high cost of EVs and I think I, I, I do pretty well, but I mean, getting an EV might be a little bit beyond my means. Uh, on that panel, I learned something uh, which caused me to be able to drive an EV today. Uh, if you look at the secondhand EV market, uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to afford. I have a I have a BMW i3 that's two years old that I paid about half what the sticker cost was. And I think that level of education that needs to be spread into the minority community, because you can afford an EV, you can get one that maybe isn't as nice and pay a little bit less. And I think the same goes for uh, education on solar issues. So we're spending a lot of time talking to our frontline and fence line community partners and saying, you know, hey, um, there's probably a solar program in your area that can help you uh, decrease your energy bills if you choose to. Um, so we try and take a, a really holistic approach, but, uh, and we think uh, looking at the clean energy economy, uh, we see a lot of folks who've been displaced by this pandemic in terms of work. And, and we think there are gonna be a lot of opportunities in that economy to retrain some of these people to be uh, solar installers, folks who maintain EV uh, infrastructure, uh, jobs that can't get outsourced. So um, we look at a lot of different avenues and, and, and we will hopefully continue to partner with all of you good people. Um, thanks for inviting me. Great, well, it's, it's our pleasure to have you, John. Thanks so much. Um, our final panelist uh, is Stephanie Chen. Um, Stephanie, you might be coming to us the furthest away from DC um, on, the, on the West Coast. So thank you for getting up a little early and uh, for, for your part in joining us this morning. Uh, welcome to the panel, welcome to the expo, and um, it's great to see you. Thanks so much, Dan, and good afternoon, everybody from sunny California. Uh, as Dan mentioned, my name is Stephanie Chen, and I am with MCE. We are California's first community choice aggregator, which is a local government agency serving 34 communities across four counties in the San Francisco Bay Area. Today, I'd like to offer up a different way of approaching environmental policy and briefly share some examples from California about what that approach can look like. So to date, the dominant strategy around environmental policy and investments has been a top-down one. You go for these big planet-wide wins first and you worry about the local, more difficult challenges later. But as we've seen pretty much time and again, that approach just perpetuates racial and socioeconomic inequities. 
In California, where we have cap and trade and we have some of the most progressive environmental regulations in the country, pollution is still concentrated in the same black and brown communities where it's always been concentrated. And we are definitely not the only place where this happens. So instead of starting big and hoping for a trickle down, which often never comes, what if we start local and we aggregate those wins up? What if we start with our most impacted communities, we identify all of the pollution sources and we prioritize replacing them with cleaner alternatives? This approach still makes progress towards the global goal of climate change mitigation, and it still uses all of the tools that my fellow panelists have talked about and that we are very familiar with in this sector. But it does so by placing the most impacted communities at the front of the line instead of the back of the line. So I think a good example of this approach has been the California climate investments. After we enacted cap and trade, we passed a series of bills that dedicates 35% of our auction revenues to projects that reduce emissions and create jobs in environmental justice communities. This money goes towards projects like low income weatherization, electrified public transit, climate smart agriculture, and urban greening, which is planting trees in concrete jungles. Collectively, these investments add up to more than $3 billion, and that's billion with a B, since 2013 all invested in and for the benefit of EJ communities. Now, of course, if you want to invest in EJ communities, you have to identify them. So the first of these targeted investment bills also created the Cal Enviro screen. Cal Enviro screen looks at 20 different environmental and socioeconomic indicators to identify the communities that are most burdened by poverty and pollution together. While this tool was created for directing climate investment funds, it has proven to be incredibly helpful across really all clean energy policy analysis because we know where our target geographies are. We know their demographics, we know their environmental impacts, and we can look specifically at those areas and identify what's working and what's still needed. Now, I wanna double click on Kelly's remarks, which centered on inclusion. And this means that we need to build inclusive processes and we need to be intentional about that. One of the key principles of environmental justice is that the communities that are closest to the problem are also those that are closest to the solution. So in keeping with this principle, one of the most innovative of the climate investments is called transformative climate communities. Transformative climate communities is built around an inclusive process where community members come together to determine how best to spend their grant based on the needs that they themselves identify. And these are also not just participatory processes, but they result in holistic projects, which is super unique because most of the incentive or grant programs that we see in the clean energy space just operate in one lane. You've got your solar incentive, you've got your weatherization incentive, you've got your EV incentive. So um, one of the great examples from the first round of Transformative Climate Communities grants is Watts um, and an organization called Watts Rising. Now, Watts, probably many of you, have, when I say Watts, you first think of the Watts riots. Watts is uh, just south of, of downtown LA. It is disproportionately low income. It's overwhelmingly black and Latino, and it's kind of nestled in the crook of two freeways. Um, the LAX flight path goes right over it. Traffic from the port of Long Beach goes right past it. Um, it's, it's been an impacted community ever since that concept existed. So in Watts, community leaders and local organizations brought together more than 200 residents over the course of several months for a planning and design process as part of TCC. And as a result, Watts will be getting hundreds of units of energy efficient affordable housing, bike paths, urban farms, solar installations, cooler playground surfaces, and more than 4,000 new trees all in about two and a half of the most impacted square miles in all of California. And last, as has been talked about in, by many of the speakers on this panel, we can't forget that this approach also has to be economically just, which is especially important now as we think about economic recovery and the role that clean energy can play in it. In a lot of EJ communities, the polluting industries often offer the best jobs. And a lot of families have put their kids through college by working in the same facilities that are giving their kids asthma. So we need to make sure that we put in place the mechanisms we need to both train and sustain a nationwide clean energy workforce. Clean energy jobs need to offer family supporting wages, robust benefits, 
and opportunities for career advancement because we don't want anybody to have to choose between a good job and a green job. Now, as a best practice, some of the most successful energy justice projects in California have included a local hiring requirement. My agency, MCE, uh, our mission is to combat climate change through local clean energy investments. And one of our flagship projects is called MCE Solar One. It's a 10 megawatt solar farm on brownfield land next to a Chevron refinery. The city of Richmond, where the project is located, has a 50% local hiring requirement on projects like this. And at the time, there weren't enough trained solar installers in Richmond for us to meet that requirement for such a big project. So we partnered with a nonprofit local job training program called Solar Richmond, who essentially trained us a cohort so that we could meet the local job requirement. And we ended up having folks graduate from Solar Richmond on Friday and start work on Solar One the following Monday. And for a lot of those participants, not only was this a good job and a good career springboard, but they also told us that it really meant a lot to them to be building something that was clean and green in their own community, when for so long, the only things that anybody ever wanted to build there were polluting facilities. So I want to close by noting that the unifying theme of all of these efforts, which we're so excited about here in California, is that they are local by design. They focus on the most impacted communities, on the most polluting facilities, and on the families that need the financial incentives the most, and the small businesses that need the financial incentives the most. They're economically progressive, they're environmentally progressive, and in the aggregate, they will result in significant change that we would not otherwise be able to achieve through an exclusively top-down approach. I think we talk a lot in policy about low-hanging fruit and high-hanging fruit, and if we build a tool that can reach the highest fruit on the tree, we will be able to reach every other fruit on that tree as well. So let's aim high. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, uh, really excellent remarks. Um, I love the, uh, the difference between a good job and a green job. I think that's just such a great way to put that. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to transition not just to Q&A, but also to discussion. Um, I'm not going to pepper you with questions and, and go through the roster of, you know, Paula, then Abby, then Kelly. Um, I, I would really just love to listen to what you all have to say and, and have a discussion. Um, as a reminder, we are getting questions online. So we do have a fair number of people watching us online and they're asking us questions. If you um, have a question, uh, you can send it to us two ways. One is by following us on Twitter at EESI online. The other is by sending us an email, EESI at EESI.org. And before I forget, John, uh, your comments, you talked a lot about EVs. Um, the uh, uh, executive director of the Electric Drive Transportation Association, Genevieve Cullen, will be with us a little bit later this afternoon on our sustainable transportation panel. Um, I could listen to Genevieve talk about EVs all day, and hopefully some of you will join us for that too. Um, I'm going to start the Q&A, or start, excuse me, start the discussion, and then I will open it up and I'm just let you have it, let you have at it. I want to follow up on some of the things that Stephanie was saying. Um, and specifically the anecdote that always comes to my mind is um, we had a briefing last year, ESI hosted a briefing last year on coastal resilience in Louisiana. And one of our panelists told a story about how a community-based approach to climate adaptation was changing people in his community and changing their minds about how they think about this. And he said, and, and he was from a place in Louisiana that is literally disappearing. And so this is something that's very, very of mind to him. And he said something along the lines of, in the past, our communities were told about decisions and now we're part of the decision-making. And I think about what he said all the time. And I think that's one of the, I think it's just, it's a profound thing to, the, the, the difference between those two things is profound. And my question to you all to get the conversation started is, how do we actually make uh, climate policy more community-based? And how do we ensure that at the front end of decision-making and policy-making, we're hearing from those in frontline communities who are most impacted? Um, I'd like to offer up a couple of thoughts on that, Dan. Um, one is that as as we are thinking about policy and progress and particularly in the space of climate we know how dire this crisis is and we know that we needed to act three days ago not today or tomorrow so there's this sense of urgency and and oftentimes that sense of urgency can feel in competition with the need for inclusion because inclusive processes take time 
Um, you don't want folks only involved in the decision making, you know, being the customer in the restaurant that's choosing off the menu. We want our most impacted communities to be the ones in the kitchen designing the menu of options that everyone then can choose from. And that process takes time, particularly when you're talking about communities that are not as well versed in the solutions, the technical and economic solutions and levers, um, but they are incredibly well versed in community needs and also in what communities have to bring to the table to this fight, which is oftentimes more substantial than anyone who lives outside of that community realizes. So I think the first thing is that inclusive processes take time um, and that needs to be built into our policy process. And the second thing is that for stakeholders, it's incredibly important for us to be building relationships like the kinds of relationships that John was talking about when we don't have an immediate need in front of us. We want to build those relationships on a level playing field. We don't want to come in and say, hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm with MCE and we have this great thing that we think you're going to love. That's not the way to build a truly balanced relationship. We want to we want to start that approach in between those urgent needs. So it can really be a balanced conversation to say, what do you care about? What do you want? Here's what I care about. Here's what I want. Let's find our common ground together. Okay, thanks. Uh, John, please go ahead. Just... All right, go ahead. Oh. Uh, John. Okay, um, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I've not been at NRDC for a long period of time. And what I found is that we have an entire um, team that just focuses on EJ issues. Um, and they do that in each of our um, look in our U.S. based offices. And so we try and meet our community partners where they are. Uh, for instance, we litigated on behalf of Flint residents. We didn't do ads and raise money about it, but we just went in and did it. Um, and, and, and we built a lot of goodwill that way. But we have our challenges, too. I mean, we we try we've we've in the past, I think, worked with communities and asked them to be an advocate for a specific set of policy proposals and then basically not done anything after they were helpful. Uh, we're trying to fix that now, uh, and and, to, and you're right. We have to build those relationships when we don't need each other, and have to build that level of trust to where when we do need to come together for common good, then we can definitely do that. And I think we have a renewed focus at NRDC now to try and and recreate the, some of those relationships and strengthen them in other places. I, I just really wanted to add that I think, you know, this is just a really an example and demonstration of why community members should be involved from the beginning, right? The fact that we are working now to build relationships is really indicative of the problem. Um, we shouldn't be working to build relationships because those people should, these community members should already be involved. They should be in our organizations. And what real diversity and inclusion looks like is that they are there from the beginning before a problem has ever been identified. And in fact, they are the informants that tell our organizations where the problems are. Um, and so, you know, to Stephanie and John's point, it's the, the time to do stuff is when there's nothing happening. Like this is the time to do it when there's absolutely nothing going on. Um, and all and it's not it's not a uh, an environmentalist problem. It's not an industry problem. We all do it the wrong way in my opinion, which is that we have something that we're trying to address. We need a community to support that. Then we go in and we tell them what we think the problem is and how we need them to support it and what that support looks like. Um, that entire process is completely backwards in my opinion. Um, and that for all of us, we, we have to be challenged by being there um, when there's nothing happening and allowing community members to come to us and say to us, look, here are some things that are happening that we need your help with. And specific to um, the, the issue of trying to get ahead of the problem and bringing people into your organization, I think that's exactly what we're talking about when we say that to have a diverse workforce, to have an inclusive workforce, helps you to identify what may be a problem so that you can design it out so it doesn't begin have start to begin with. So I think in terms of businesses, it's bringing these community-focused mindsets and bringing the communications disciplines into your project management or into your project development. And then for policy, I think it's funding state and local 
uh, um, jurisdictions to be able to uh, to help bring people around the table, right? So have that funding there, like prioritize it because it's important that we avoid the problems to begin with because they're more expensive once they happen. Great. Uh, thanks. Now, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. There is sort of this natural inclination to procrastinate and to put it off and to, you know, pay tomorrow for a hamburger today and, and all of the different, you know, platitudes that you can offer. But, um, you know, when they affect people's lives um, and their livelihoods, um, it's really, really serious. And it's, um, it's, it's, there's something in, there's something in us that help that makes it difficult for us to get, to get over that. I'm wondering, so for me, this is the, the, I think the first time I really thought a lot about these issues was after Hurricane Katrina. I remember working on the Hill then and watching just, you know, round the clock footage of this. It was, it, I, it was just, it was sickening to, to see sort of how people were being, you know, sort of left behind and, um, you know, can't even imagine what it was like in that stadium back then. And it was really, really sad. And I was kind of hopeful that, that we would learn from that, but I'm not sure that we did. And we're still struggling with a lot of these problems. Um, you all have done a great job sort of articulating the problem and articulating the challenges and but also the solutions and i'm wondering how what we can do to make sure that this time is different so how do we how do we system how do we systematize how do we embed sort of what we need to be doing better you know that that process those relationship buildings before there's a problem uh, what can we be doing sort of in a tangible way um that we're not currently doing to prevent sort of being back here in a couple of years, having a similar panel and lamenting the fact that, you know, we still have all this progress to make. Dan, I think that's a really important question and um, one that keeps me up at night, right? Is this moment gonna pass and no uh, tangible change will have occurred? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have the magic answer. I know, I, I forget who said it, but someone, more than one of you used the word intentionality, right? So I think, we can't just sit and hope it'll be different. Like we have to act with intention. Um, embedded in the second, the, the oh, everyone's answer to your first question was investing in relationships, right? And so investing time and energy and space in relationships that can be personal relationships, organizational relationships, or community to community relationships. Um, it really matters because those are the things that I think that's, you know, we're all humans. In addition to being whatever our job title is, we're, we are human beings and those relationships really matter. Um, but I think, you know, what, what we are struggling with at SIA and what perhaps others are as well is how um, environmental justice, how do we embed that into our decision making process, into our policy, you know, what we advocate for, how we do our business um, and how do we bring those frontline communities into our business model, right? And into our kind of community of folks that are thinking about this. Um, I, as I said, I don't have the answer, but I think that is a different enough frame from how we've always done it. Um, that if we can crack some of those things and figure out the answers there, I think we will um, at least have a chance of making some progress on this. You know, what, I, I think what I would love to, to add is, you know, part of it, I think, in my mind is how do we ensure that environmental justice isn't the one off? Um, because we, we as, and I, and, you know, in the 30 years that I've worked in this industry, everything is a silo, which um, and even things that we all commonalities that we have in terms of problems, we still deal with them in a siloed manner, which um, is way more expensive absolutely inefficient and likely to fail, right? Those things are always guaranteed because we're not working together. Um, and so I think when we talk about environment justice, one of the things that we have as an association is a set of principles, but I actually have members who work in environmental justice and I bring them in on every policy position that we debate. Um, those individuals are sitting there talking about it and informing and educating us because we don't all know. And so my utility folks may not have an environmental justice hat, but I have somebody who can say, hey, look, here are the environmental impacts to, for what we're deciding. And we need to think about what are the nuances and other connection points that we should be considering as we're making recommendations as an organization. And um, 
we don't always get it right, but that's our starting point, right? Is always ensuring that every single voice and every single sector or interest is represented in every decision that we make so that we at least can learn from them um, about what we may not know and what may be hidden um, and then begin to solve problems or provide recommendations for those problems. I want to say we need better leadership. So um, incredibly awesome. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say we need better leadership. We, we, we haven't had leadership at the presidential level since, uh, since Bill Clinton, really, in his 1994 or executive order. I mean, I think President Obama was, was, a, was a bit better of a leader than, than maybe uh, other predecessors. Like, uh, but we need leadership on all levels. Uh, we need governors to care about this, mayors to care about it, um, elected leaders at all levels to care about environmental justice. And I think that's sort of uh, some of our responsibilities as well as folks who work in policy uh, to push this, to make this a priority for uh, those elected leaders um, so that they can then actually craft the policies that will keep this from being a one-off. Because I worked in a, a couple of congressional offices and uh, I can tell you, we didn't talk about EJ and one of those offices was uh, a member of color. Um, and we had a very poor district, but we, in the, in the two years that I was there, I don't recall us really talking about it, taking the lead on an EJ issue. So, and that's, that was bad on us. Kelly? No, I, I agree with, I, I violently agree with all of the statements said before. Um, I think uh, what I wanted to add to that is um, in, in what Abby said in terms of being intentional and what everyone else has been talking about as being intentional is to formalize that intent, right? So as a very first step, if you're, whether you're a company or whether you're a policymaker, to formalize that intent um, begin to measure it. Take measure like SIA has in terms of, you know, what your diversity and inclusion, so at every level of your organization, and then require people to be trained to have this consciousness and this intent, like make sure that it's included. And then the other parts may or may not follow, but at least we'll all be intentional about what we're doing, right? So I just think it's so important to not just formalize, but to communicate that so that we know that we're in in this together. Thanks. And I would Go add ahead. that, oh, sorry, Dan. I would no, add ahead, that ahead, um, we, gotta, we gotta invest in this. Um, we have to yeah. be willing to, because we live in a capitalist society and our economy drives social change just as much as policy does. Um, and so we need to make sure that we are designing ways for environmental justice solutions to be profitable for the industries that are a part of them. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of opinions about the way that California goes about doing this um, and, and whether it's a cost effective solution. But one of the things that we have seen, um, you know, for example, with our, with our solar incentives and we're starting to see with storage is that money actually can buy change. Um, and so I think we need to not forget the role that, um, that our economy can play and make sure that we are pointing that engine, particularly when we enter the recovery phase, in the policy direction that we want it to go. Yeah, yeah we, we can mobilize that engine of, of capitalism any direction we want it to go, right? We can, we, we can harness exactly. it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask a question from um, one someone who's following us online and this has to do with educational opportunities um, and the, the question is uh, what to what extent does the do educational opportunities or choices made uh, by students of color impact their access to employment um, this question specific to renewables but in general and I wonder if if any of you have thoughts about that and what we could be doing um, sort of this idea of, you know, building these relationships in advance, if we're, you know, sort of filling that pipeline of future leaders and future professionals and future engineers and helping to diversify that at the front end, um, uh, what, what, what are some ideas that you might have around how we could do that um, within sort of the academy? If I could. Dan, I'd like to actually just expand that question a little bit for us. It's not just about the choices that students are making, it's about the options on the menu as well. So how can we make sure that the that there's a comprehensive suite of options on the menu for folks to choose from and that folks have the ability to choose according to their 
inclinations and their abilities, not just these are the only two options that are available to me at the time. So let's think about both sides of that question. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's, 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 it's not a choice, right? Uh, uh, not, not, not for everyone. Exactly. You know, I, I think one of the things in, that we should think about, particularly for students, is um, we, we in, in, in pursuing of opportunities, so we talk a lot about education, and that may be um, high school and then a certificate or a community college or four-year or, or whatever that is. Um, we don't talk enough about the importance of a network and having access mm -hmm. to a network. Um, and we quite frankly, I think lead our kids to believe that the education is like, once you get that degree, you're golden. Um, and that's just simply not true. I was speaking with a colleague who has a program focused on this, and he talked about the fact that many times you will see first generation students um, be underemployed because they don't have a network when they graduate that allows them to pursue an opportunity that's really more fit in with the skills that they've gained. Um, and so I think we have to do more about connecting with students in school um, and giving them access to our network. So I, my children have access to my network and my children have found jobs because they've had access to the network of people that I know and I can share who they are with. Um, but I think we as an industry have to start to seek students out um, and share with them not only what the opportunities are, but also I think share with them in a way that the opportunities are limitless in, in a way, right? That we don't tell them that you have to be an engineer and that's the only way you're gonna get to be um, the next Abby Hopper, for example, right? There are lots of ways that we navigate kind of the world. And, and I think we all have, every one of us has a very different story as to how we ended where we are. And I, for me personally, there's never in a million years that anyone would have imagined that my background that I would have been here. I wouldn't have imagined that. Um, but we have to share that with our students and then work with them and encourage them um, and really kind of open up the door, right? And give them the kinds of insights that they're not gonna get about um, the importance of emotional intelligence, um, the importance of being a likable person, right? <laughs> that being smart, um, and having great abilities um, are absolutely important, but people liking you and having a good attitude um, and all that other stuff actually really matters um, in terms of as they're pursuing a career. I'll just, I'll just add on to that. I think, again, going back to the intentionality piece, we have to intentionally be in some of those uh, historically black colleges and universities um, and reach out to students of color. Um, my organization, again, as an example, um, we have long had relationships with Ivy's and Stanford, Duke, uh, some other really good schools. Uh, and we end up with a lot of great interns because they come out of those schools and, and those schools pay for the internships. But we've not done the same with uh, colleges of color. Uh, we're starting to do that now. Uh, we were on track to do that uh, this summer, but the pandemic uh, sort of stepped on that. Um, but we are trying now because I got my first job in the environment over 20 years ago. And I can say um, there are no more people of color uh, in the community than there were then. And if so, it's only by a margin. Uh, our organization, uh, we are now trying to do a much better, uh, more comprehensive job. And, and, and to be candid, uh, some of the civil unrest has really opened a lot of folks' eyes uh, uh, with our, within our leadership and within some of our senior ranks. Uh, but we've been talking about diversity and inclusiveness and equity uh, for much of the last two years. Uh, I think now there's a really strong push to do something about it. And I think that's happening around the community. I noticed the Sierra Club uh, uh, made a statement about their founder a couple of days ago and talked about their commitment to people of color. Uh, I know my friends at Earth Justice, uh, just to name some of some of the national environmental groups, are also making really strong pushes to diversify um, not only their their workforce but the places where we work. Um, so, but we do have to be intentional and and think about it every day. to Paula's point about opening up our networks. Um, I pulled out my cheat sheet of our from our diversity study because we asked about this. We asked if you think about how do how do people get jobs, right? Like, 
you know, I, I will echo John, like I've, I've gotten almost every job I had through people I know and people I've worked with and my own network. Um, but we we asked um, the percentage of employees who found their jobs through a referral or by word of mouth. 44% of the white respondents um, got their job through a referral or word of mouth and only 28% of black respondents. And so it sort of goes to that point of opening up the network and providing sort of validation for others that yes, this is important. Paula and I co-hosted um, an event last year at Solar Power International um blacks and solar and you know you can give me a hard time that having a happy hour is really is that really social justice Abby? um but but our intent was really to create space right and create some of those networks and open up our networks to others i um i have, i feel like that that piece of the work and that emotional intelligence and that humanness um, is so critically important and yes getting an engineering degree alone um, is unlikely to differentiate you from the, all of the other folks uh, who also have engineering degrees. So yes, we're, let's keep opening up those networks. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, that's really important. Uh, and you know, I, when when I heard Polity talking, the the word mentor popped right up in my head. Right? I mean, you can you know, that doesn't have to be something you're asked to do. Right? That's something you can offer to do. Um, and when you see people with promise and people who you know who have that drive, um, it's probably on all of us who have the ability to do it. I know I certainly benefited um, from people who I've looked up to, people, two people, in fact, on this panel, uh, who certainly helped me out a lot and uh, really, really appreciated and, you know, have to have to pay that forward and do that to, to others. Um, we are doing well on time, um, but I do kind of want to ask us one question. Um, we've talked a lot about, um, so now we've talked about what we can do and when we should be doing it. Um, I'd like to ask you, looking ahead, maybe three or five years, how will we know that what we're talking about today will have made a difference? Um, what I'm, I'm wondering from your organization's perspective or from your personal experience, what will progress look like to you? How will you be convinced that progress has happened? And for, for people who are um, you know, watching us online, what are the kinds of goals that you all have whether it's in representation or whether it's, you know, staff diversity, board diversity, uh, cultivating these community relationships. What are the near term goals that we all have to adopt, our organizations have to adopt to really advance environmental justice? Well, I think just just something I've observed sitting here with you all, I think in three to five years, if a panel that it looks as diverse as what we have here right now is not remarkable and we all have made progress, right? And this is, to me, a remarkable panel of experts that look a lot different from each other. Um, and I don't think that's all that common yet. It's a easy and it's like just a snippy answer back. I think there's some other things for real, but this, that, that just is my gut reaction that I feel like I have to share. I think I want to touch okay. on the... Oh. I think I want to touch I on the question something. of... Oh. I'll let you sort it out. Sorry. <laughs> I think I want to touch on the question of metrics, right? Someone mentioned earlier that what gets measured gets done. And I think what we've seen across um, the mainstream environmental space is if we set a goal, even if it is an audacious goal, and we dedicate resources and we put all the tools in our toolbox towards reaching that goal, we can get there. And so it's just a question of setting goals that are centered around justice and using our same set of tools that we have been using all along and pointing them in a different direction. Um, so I think that the change will look in some ways very subtle because we will be using all of the same tools, but it will look radically different in terms of what we are using those tools for um, and who is at the table, um, as has been the subject of many of the, um, the speaker's remarks here today. Okay. I, Paula, I, you and Abby both wanted to go, so maybe we'll start with you, Paula. Okay, I want, and I wanted to just add on to something that Kelly said, because I think um, she's right, that a panel that looks like this is, I will, in my experience, incredibly rare, um, like happens 
couple times a year rare. Um, but I think if I could walk into a room and not be the only person who said there is something wrong with this picture, because I can count the people of color on one hand, and like, it, I, and we don't have to be the people who have to say, you know, Ab, if Abby and I and Kelly are together, we're not the ones saying, how come there aren't more women here? But that there's a man saying, what the heck, this is a problem. I think that to me is significant progress because that, that's a demonstration that we're all focused on the same thing and we recognize it. Uh, um, Courtney and I were going to say the same thing. What gets measured gets done. And so that's part of why we invest in the, the diversity study so that we know what our starting point is and we can measure progress in terms of um, gender and racial diversity, but also kind of where in our organizations um, those diverse folks sit. Uh, I think about board diversification. If you go on my website and you look at my board, it is uh, it's very white <laughs> and very male, um, and so there's clear clear progress to be made there. Um, and I think you know I don't know quite what the metric is for bringing um, community like frontline communities and, and impacted communities into the policy discussion. I don't I don't know how we measure that yet, but that to me is part of what progress looks like. Thanks, um, John. I'm happy to give you the last word on this or any other topic. You're just about out of time, but we'd love to hear from you again. Okay, um, I'll just I'll I'll go back to how do we measure? Uh, we have I'm not going to go through specifics, but we have certainly suggested to our board, which also suffers from a lack of diversity, uh, some goals that they should incorporate um, a certain number uh, by um, a certain set of years, and we've given them a roster of names of folks that we think um, uh, would fit that bill. Um, I think that's one way of doing it. Uh, we, we, our staff um, sort of s sat together and came up with a group of folks that we think uh, would be good fits, uh, but also in, in terms of our diversity uh, within our staff, I mean, which is also remarkably low. Uh, and it's just, it's hard. I mean, I've been, I've, I've made two hires since I've been here and both of which have been persons of color who would not have probably even applied for the organization, uh, but for me reaching out to them saying, you know, I know you, I know your work ethic, and I think you'd be really great in this role, uh, please apply. Uh, and I wasn't, and we have a really kind of tortured way of hiring here. Um, so a lot of other people had to agree that they were, they were good fits before they came on board. Uh, but I think, you know, if I'm not here, then they're not here. So we have to continue to bring folks in uh, who look different from us or like us in my my and Paula's case, uh, but it's 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 going to take again. I'll go back to intentionality. We have to want to do it and and think about it every day. Great. Well, um, this was um, just tremendous. Um, you know, uh, a wonderful panel um, to collectively, individually. Thank you all for your leadership and your willingness to join us today at the at the expo and sort of share your thoughts and experiences and, and help us understand sort of what this issue looks like, but also really what we can do about it. And, and I hope our online audience is um, leaving this panel uh, as I am, which is, um, you know, inspired, um, feeling not good about the situation, but at least good about our prospects if we all put our minds to it. Um, and um, really just want to say thank you to Paula, Abby, uh, Kelly, John, and Stephanie for um, a wonderful panel. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and end it there. Um, we um, are going to take a short break. Um, and um, that's going to allow Omri, Troy, and Dano and I to have a bite to eat. Um, our next panel will start at 1.30, and that is uh, Energy Efficient Buildings as Grid Resources. Um, this is also a really great opportunity um, to recognize that it is not just me uh, sitting in the office today magically making this happen. Um, there is, in fact, a phalanx of people. Uh, Omri next door uh, is our indispensable communications director. Uh, Troy, uh, who you hopefully can't see because uh, he's sort of the one really pulling the strings, he is our tech wizard and he makes this platform possible. Uh, we have Dan O, the other Dan, um, although he's not another Dan, he's a great Dan, and he is helping us just being generally helpful. He's tracking question submissions. He's providing tech redundancy. He's uh, a Johnny on the spot, and we couldn't do these sorts of things without him. Also, like to recognize Ellen, Sydney, Susan, and Tim, who are 
uh, all cogs in the mighty machine that is ESI, and they're helping us out with notes and monitoring all of this. And we have five summer interns. All of our interns this summer are remote. Um, they were being brought on when um, things were happening, and we decided that it was that we needed to have them and we wanted to have them. And so we have five interns: Abby, Bridget, Grace, Maeve, and Maya. Uh, they are helping with notes. They're helping with social media. They're helping with questions and. Um, you know, at any given moment, we have this group of uh, this cadre of interns and, um, you know, they're really great. And we're spending a lot of time thinking about sort of how we can diversify that that group of people who join EESI as well. Um, there's also someone very special who is not with us today. Um, she is remote, um, but we couldn't have done the expo without her, Becky Blood. Um, she has been indispensable. Uh, and a wonderful team player and just someone who I've only known since like January and I can't even imagine what December would have been like or was like. Um, she just gets so much work done and has been so helpful. So thanks to everyone. Now off for uh, some sandwich and maybe some chips. Uh, we will be back here at 1.30 for energy efficient buildings at Grid Resources and then we'll have two more panels after that. Sustainable transportation and new frontiers in clean energy research and development. As a reminder, you will have to close or refresh your browser window if you'd like to join us at 1.30 for the next panel. Leaving this one open won't actually work. You'll have to restart it. Uh, hopefully that's not a problem. And if you have two minutes, we would really appreciate your time taking a quick survey. There's a link there. We do really uh, pay attention to all the feedback that we receive and it helps us think about these things and bring panels like this to you all um, uh, to, to make sure that we're topical and relevant and, and getting our uh, policymakers and the public the information they need. We'll end it there. Thanks again to our panelists, and we'll be back at 1.30.